You guys really? Whoa, whoa, whoa. You guys we really? The ducks? You guys <laughs> really cleaned up this room? Yeah, man. What's up, man? Such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, guys, what's up, everyone? Good to see you. Oh, what's up? That's how you do it, man. When you, when you command the room, you walk in and you speak to everybody, Gary V. 100%. I like that. I like, I like that. people. I yeah, realized man. my secret sauce was something that was always there. Hold up. Limitless. Take a simmer cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way up in the get me up. Uh, on the mission, get me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a simmer cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way up in the get me up. Uh, on the mission, get me up. Uh, Welcome to the pivot. We got a saying, man. This is the home of the almost famous, right? <laughs> and the place where everything always works out. Uh, right. Ryan Clark, man, Fred Taylor. Channing Crowd on behalf of us. I'm man. still mad at Fred. Why? Oh. What'd you do, Fred? I'll explain. Fred, actually, it sparked a great run for the Jets. There was a week five game. I think it's week five, because I think it made the Jets one and four that year. And that's what brought Chad Pennington in to replace Vinny. I don't know if you remember this, Fred, but I don't remember to play clear enough to nail it like I normally do. But I think it was like a very simple screen pass or something crazy. But Fred went for like an 85 or 90 yard <laughs> touchdown against the Jets. We lost like 40 to, it was a blowout city. I'm still mad about it. You guys were in Jacksonville. Uh huh. We had Beasley, one of my former teammates had gone over. Aaron, exactly. Yeah, yep. Bees had went over. From West Virginia, right? Yeah, from mm -hmm. VA. I remember a few times though, y'all got us when Keyshawn was here in the playoffs. Well, 98, that's one of the best days of my life. 98, when he had the interception, he had Fumble touchdown. Return. He did yeah, I remember. All that, that whole no, game. No, but that man. game specifically, Crazy. you went ballistic. But yeah. anyway, I'm super, listen, let me just say this for your <laughs> fan base. I am so genuinely proud of you guys. This show is a real show. Like, I really watch everything. That's what I do for a living. If I, I would have been a great athlete, I would have watched film for real. <laughs> right, 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 like, I'd be great sure. at film work. I really pay attention, and I, like, I'm really honored to be here. I think you guys have put together a real show that brings value, right. that people watch, that always has something, and so I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, like, like we said, man, we're excited to have you. I think the one thing we're focused on is continuing to not only build value in our brand, but build value in our content. And the, the dope part, but also the hard part about having you on is that like you're willing to share. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you're not hiding anything about how you got to be at this point. The but, reverse. Right. I'm obsessed with oversharing. Right, but the, the, here's what's crazy to me, right? Everybody knows Gary V now, where you are, the things you've accomplished, where you've come from, but you're a kid that was born in Belarus. You're you're an immigrant, you know, and you mention often your parents lived the American dream, but that didn't mean that you were handed things. How do you get to this point after having a family that had to build a life in America? You know, one of the reasons I've always done super well in connecting with athletes or or people in music, like a lot of people know what it's like to not have a lot and to get to a place and it's common. That's why entrepreneurship has been really fun for me. When I was a kid, I'm 46, when I was a kid, most people that didn't come from a whole lot and then got somewhere really did come in places like sports and entertainment because that was the era of college, get a job, entrepreneurship wasn't really talked about. Right. For me, I had a really funny thing. Not only were we very poor when we first got to America and then slowly went from poor to middle class, but my mother, who's the most important person in my life, I'm sorry, Dad, like you're tied, I get it, but like <laughs> my mom is also one of the cheapest people on earth, which me and my sister had this, because we're three and a half years younger, my brother AJ, who you, you know you know a little bit like is 11 years younger. Me and my sister had more of a similar childhood we just had like an aha moment like five years ago of wait a minute, yes, we didn't have a whole lot growing up, but then it was compounded because my mom is the cheapest person on earth. <laughs> right. So we were living like way worse than we were and we were really just kind of coming up. I think for me, it's why I think I put out so much content. The world is a complicated place. Yeah. It's, right, it's not perfect. It's got all sorts of strengths and weaknesses, flaws. Obviously, there's three black men in front of me. I grew up in, from Belarus in the Soviet Union. The suppression, the issue was being Jewish, right? Like, so both my grandfathers spent 
one of my grandfathers spent 10 years in jail basically for being Jewish. So I was always very connected to, okay, certain countries suppress religion, some suppress race, but always, I always saw optimism. My brain always said, if anybody has ever done it, well then in theory, you could too. It might be hard, there's a lot of things that go along with it, but I think I'm a byproduct of scrapping for my shit. You know, like at 10 years old, when everybody got Nintendo, cause it was 85, 86, and that was the big thing, you know, for me it was like, go and get it. And so that led to lemonade stands, that led to shoveling snow, that led to selling sports cards. I just have always been accountable for my success, but even more importantly, where I spend a lot of my time, I've been accountable for my happiness. There's always shit around me that's going on that is not in my control, that is not going well, that I can't control, but I can control how I decide to look at it. And I think, I think that's why I'm passionate about communicating now. No matter how fucked up, your, both your parents, you're a foster child, both your parents are this, you, you grew up this way, that way. The reality is for everything we've ever seen that's been very hard, there's been stories of people that have gotten there and I want people to latch on to that versus the reality of what happens, which is if you've decided it's over, it's over. So he mentioned he mentioned happiness. Hold on, man. I'm gonna go and crack this happy dad. Because that, that, that was the that was the first question. And we already didn't got deep, man. Shout out to Happy Dad, our know, sponsor, right? man. For we sure. appreciate y'all. But sheesh. But, no, and it's funny, Gary, because you always talk about I saw something you did talking about like attacking uh, attacking the negative people, negative influence in your life. And I got something amongst us, like everything's gonna work out. It's one of the things that we kind of jumped to hold with our with our, with our new venture. And Ryan, I think he has he has coined it toxic positivity mm. is my approach to things. And somebody just recently, when I said that, I was like, everything's gonna work out. And they said, would a bum think that? Mm -hmm. Would a mother of five that's struggling, you know, on food stamps, would they think that everything's gonna the, work out? The answer is yes. There's plenty of bums. Mm -hmm. homeless, I assume, in that context, and mothers of five that think that. There's plenty of billionaires and millionaires and on paper looking real good to all of us that don't think that. Mm -hmm. Being practical optimistic or being cynical negative has nothing to do with the financial status or the on paper status. Why do I know that? Because I'm 46 and now I've lived a little bit, a little bit, mm -hmm. and I can name on both sides of the column dozens of each. I can name dozens of people who've got it great on paper. Everybody watching right now will be like, that looks good. Yeah. Money, family, location, gender, rate, whatever you want to go with. That I know them personally and they only believe everything's not gonna work out. They're anxious 24 seven. And I know people on the left column or the right column, depending on what side you're looking at the camera right now, who have plenty of ridiculous adverse situations. That was the advantage of growing up the way I did. I got unlimited that who are, everything's gonna work out. This concept of, I think toxic positivity conversation, I haven't delved into it, so I'm not gonna talk shit because I don't like talking about things I don't know, but it fascinates the fuck out of me because if you don't have optimism, the fuck do you have? Yeah. Like, what are ne we doing negativity. here? Negativity, you got, it gotta go either way. <laughs> yeah, like, you know how they say you're never still, you're either moving forward or backwards? I always love that, I'm like, that makes sense. It's not like, it feels like you might, like, just, but it's always one or the other. I'd like everyone on the other side of the camera to let me know, like, what? How has that type of pos positivity for you, though, affected your success? Because it could put you in a place to where sometimes you're thinking everything's gonna work out and you're so positive that you're lazy, right? That, that, that you sit back and you wait for it to happen. That wasn't the way you viewed the world. I mean, you built a company, bro, from three million to 60 million and walked away with nothing. Yes. It, it would be hard for me to be it was positive e it about was that. It was easy because it was my dad's. Okay. And I was so grateful for what my parents did by getting me to out of the Soviet Union to America that it always clouded everything. I'm like, my parents fucking saved my ass. So I was always like, whatever I can do for them. Plus, all the shit I put out on the internet that people like to like razz me for, and I love it. Like the like people that spoof me or my friends or like even people that are haters, I believe it. I believe that the four of us on this show right now are young. I, I, right. I, please God, I would like to see you three men, and I for sure for myself would like to live another 45, 50 years. That's a lot of time. Right. 
Like we're, we're at halftime yeah. in that general range. That seems like a lot of time. So for me it was easy because I left my dad's business at 34 and I was like, I got 60 years to do my thing and I checked that box that I want. I, I put the right perspective. To your point, I think, I call it practical optimism. Like I don't believe in the, I'm just gonna pray and it's gonna happen. It's all action. It's only action. You guys have accomplished what you've accomplished through action. Right. My big thing is that if you don't have optimism, I don't see how you're gonna put in the work required to get something awesome. Right. If you don't believe there's something on the other side, you, you're not gonna put in the work required to do something special or even something solid. Yeah, I just saw one of your last posts. I think it was someone at 50 years old wanted to you know, cash it in. Yeah. You know, and I like to tell these guys, they, they say, oh, you're old. I don't like to think that way, right? <laughs> I like to you? say, you know, I'm 46. On the show, bro. I'm 46 <laughs> like you, G, you know. But what I like to say, just that word for me seems to have a negative connotation, right? Because some people will give up, like you said. I like to say we're seasoned. You know, we're I wise, like we're that. experienced. We've Wiley been, vets. Because old shit, what do you do with it? Throw it, it away. away. Season stuff, you marinate, you just well, can get Fred, better. So it's, Fred, it's the for outlook. me, 46 is a ludicrous conversation. Like, like Jesus, like right. we got real years. Yeah. And I play a lot of math. So for example, one great thing about business, and this is where being in sports, this is why I really loved being in the sports business. It's tough because you're conditioned to start thinking 30s. When you're when you're a professional yeah. athlete, yeah. your brain, your whole life, you go into the locker room there, and you know, I, I assume rookie year, like there's the old dog, and he's 32. Right. And you're, so your brain's <laughs> telling you that that's old. Right. In business, I just actually today, I got off a one hour meeting with a guy who's 66 years old. He's talking about a project that's gonna take him 20 years to build. So he is 66. So for me, I've been in business and I'm like, oh, in 20 years I'm gonna be 66 like, I did this today. In 20 years I'm gonna be 66 like him. And then I love to play this game. And 20 years ago I was 26 and I'll make pretend, that was nine, you know, I was like, okay, that was 9-11. That's 100,000 right. years ago. And I start playing that game and I'm like, damn, I got so much time. I just really, I actually have really begun to believe that humans' poor relationship with time, not actually understanding how much time they do have is what's fucking everybody up. That they're too anxious, yeah. they cut corners, they're not willing to put in the process. But you don't believe in retirement? You don't believe in an end? I don't, but, but I also think it's a very personal journey. Mm -hmm. Like when I travel, I meet a 69 year old dude at like in Florida during like when I'm with my kids during downtime and I'll get into chatting and I'm pumped for that guy. He's like, I f***ing wrapped it up five years ago. I'm down here. You know, he'll make some funny joke. Like, I'm looking at the pretty girls in Miami. I've got my, uh, you know, metal detector in the sand. I'm fishing. I love, I don't know why, I love the idea of somebody who really loves fishing 10 hours a day, goes home, watches his sports. That's my goal. Bro, that's amazing. Like, honestly, on some real shit, there's a big part of me that envies that. There's a big part of me that goes, man, I wish my wiring was a little bit different because that sounds fresh. But you can do it. But I don't want to. I can tell you right now, like if you opened me up right now and read my chemicals, I want to fucking do this for the rest of my life. I like it too much, comma, if I wake up at 71 and just out of nowhere, you know how some people just do that shit and like, all right, I'm done. Like I do want to just fish. Mm. I'm very comfortable in fully following who I am. Mm. Uh, right now as I sit here, maybe I'm too on fire, maybe I got too much to do. If at 63, 71, 57, 92, it's like, nah, I wanna do this, that's fine. I only set one rule for myself, which is I'm gonna listen to myself. I'm gonna be only focused on one thing. Who am I? How do I wanna do it? Everything so far has worked out for me because the world caught up to me, not I had to conform to the world, and I'm gonna keep playing that game. Is that push, is it about money? Because let's be honest, not. Gary, you got plenty of money. Definitely or is it about not. succeeding? Like what, it's, what's you that, wanna, the goal you're chasing? You're gonna, Everybody chases something. You're gonna love this. Recently, last three, four years, honestly, I'm curious. And this will make sense to y'all. I'm just curious how great at this thing am I? Hmm. At life. Yes, but, but in my profession. At life, yes. You took it to a place that I don't even usually go to, I'm like, 
I'm just curious how great of an all-time entrepreneur can I be? It's more out of like, I'm gonna go deep with you guys. You ever see like, you know how in the summer they've got those lights and the bugs fly into it? They've got that blue light and the bugs just fly to it and buzz and they die? (laughs) On some real shit, the last five, seven years as I've gotten more in tune with myself on this, sometimes on a summer day, I'll watch it for like 10 minutes and I'll laugh and talk to myself. I'm like, I'm one of those bugs. Like, they don't even know why, but they just are so attracted to the light and they're going. I'm so attracted to the process of seeing where I end up in the anvils of entrepreneurship that I gotta see it. It's like, it's a burning desire. Here's why that's confusing Please. to me, right? When someone is as accomplished as you are, has succeeded in the ways that you do, yes. like, at some point, life is about an end game. Right, the, the journey is beautiful and everybody wants to enjoy the journey, but there's a destination for us all. Fred's one of the best football players I've ever played. I say that about him all the time. Like for him, it would be okay, I'm retired now, can I get that Hall of Fame jacket? Yes. And for you, I wanna know where does satisfaction come from? Because if you're, if you're continuously chasing that light, but you're never gonna burn up. You're never gonna, yeah, you're you're never gonna burst into flames. Right, so, so where do you find a spot to is, chill, This bro? is even more fun this answer, I've been there. I'm satisfied, I'm the most content, hungry person you'll ever meet in your life. Mm. I like that. If, if, if somebody came in this room right now and was like all weird and was like, I'm a genie from the future and I gotta tell you something Gary Vee, today, right now, this minute, while you're with these boys, this is the cap. Starting tomorrow, you're making decisions that never allows you to be as accomplished as you were right now. I'd be like, bet. So does that allow you to be as passionate to see others win yeah, because you're content that, with yourself? That is a great question. I'm not sure if that's exactly it, but I have a crazy desire for it. Right. Mainly because I don't, I think I see the world as outrageously abundant. Fred, I'll be honest with you, this will forever confuse me. The thought of not wanting somebody else to win because it might affect my winning is like the most foreign thought I've ever had. I just, now in sport, I love sports. I love competing. There's a winner, you play ping pong, somebody's gotta win it. Right. I don't want the other person to win, I wanna destroy their face. But in life, the world is abundant. And so, I don't know if my contentness matched with my desire and hunger is where that comes from. I just desperately think it would be nice if as many people as possible were happy. I just think shit would get real good. Right, yeah, real talk, <laughs> yeah. Right. No, real talk, <laughs> but that's no, real. But, but no, but just in business, like if, if there's, if McDonald's is growing stupid, Burger King's gonna drop. If stocks go up, um, something really, that's gotta not, go down. You like this, No, no, like no, this. it has to, like, like that's this. why so, the market maybe, does the maybe, market the way it may, goes. Maybe, but if the category's grown, so for example, in the 70s and 80s, that wasn't true because fast food was growing. Today, it definitely means it because it's contracting because people are eating differently. Yeah. By the way, VaynerMedia, VFriends, I'd like to beat, and you know what's funny, back to y'all, I actually learned this from sports. As a diehard fan, Jacksonville will beat our fucking ass 41 nothing, <laughs> and then the game be over and Fred's like hugging Beasley, I'm like, bees, don't touch Fred, <laughs> Fred. Like, you know, I'm, you know, But fan, that's just the Jet fan too. Fair, <laughs> fair, but, but fans, and I know everybody just laughed, fans hate it. Like the hugging and the kissing afterwards, but I understand it as I got older. Every pitch for a new piece of business, I want Vayner to win. But when we lose, if I see the agency's people that won that business, I could be like, yo, how's your wife? How's your family? Like, you want, you can, you can put it into the micro and the macro. In the micro, I'm trying to win everything. In the macro, I get it. And so, ironically, something that bothered the shit out of me in my teenage years, in my 20s, and even my early 30s, became the way I became a businessman. Which was, I will break your face on the field, but when it's triple zero, I'm gonna ask you if I can donate to your charity, or how's right. your daughter doing, or, I met your uncle, he used to recruit me. How's he doing? Like, I can have that combo. And so that's how I see it. So in that, though, you've developed a passion for communicating the different things about your experiences that has allowed you to succeed to other people. And then not even just like the people in your circle, 
but those who are young Gary V's guys, you know, and like the, the simple thing, you'll be like, hey man, just get off your fucking phone. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or, or go do this. What kind of sparked that in you to say, okay, I've gotten to this point. I've reached this level of success. Now let me reach back to the Th rest of the this, people and get them there. Two things. One, clarity for everybody listening. This is where I really am proud of this. A lot of what I talk about has less to do with me and more to do with what I've observed. So I think a lot of what I talk about is not just I've done it. I've looked at 5,000, 10,000 things. I'm like, oh, we're all doing this thing. Let me talk about that. Because sometimes shit's just too unique. Yeah. You know, like, like you could tell, like, when, you got, when people are like, I want to be like you. Well, you might move your hips in a way that just that person doesn't move their, you know? Right. So you're trying to find the common ground, that's one. Two, this is where I wish I was filming since I was 13. My favorite thing is that my grade school friends, I moved a couple times, I have a real different, I have like grammar school, high school, and college, and post-college friends. I have like four core groups. The thing I'm most proud of is I didn't really become known until my late 30s. So all these people really know me. And the thing you're talking about now, I didn't wake up at 40 or 42 or 45 and say, you know what, let me give the kids some wisdom. I've been trying to drag anybody around me to win as well, back to that plus, my whole life. So all I'm really doing now is just doing what I've done with anybody who's been around me at scale using social media. I've been wanting people to win alongside me. I get a bigger high when they're winning too because I'm fed. And I was fed before I started. Like I'm on some, you know, some people are very into the foofy, foofy, like, you know, the world's gotten very thoughtful. And so people are deep meditation, people are deep crystals and psychics and all this stuff. There's this one theory that's been going around in a conversation in my world about like, how many lives do you live? Are you like, are you on like number 800 and that's why you're so wise? I, I haven't gotten educated or deep enough into a lot of the foofy stuff, but God, let me tell you right now, I was way too wise at six years old. <laughs> my, like my emotional intelligence has been there from the get. And so, if, you know, if there's a theory that I could be sold on, on like, oh, I must be living my 800th life and you might be on your 37th, that's one I could get tricked into because I've always been there. I want to get into uh, NFTs because he knows nothing about it. I don't even get and them, Gary. I'm get pretty, it? But I'm pretty sure, much like um, I'm, I'm trying to verse myself on it even more, right? But I'm sure a lot of people that are watching For sure. the same. So, and again, it's about seeing others win and a lot of times you speak about content and getting in where you got in. You were doing a lot of stuff before everybody thought it was sexy, before yes. they thought it was cool. Yes. You know, early Coinbase yes. investor. You invest early in a whole lot of things. Yes. Can you break it down to the most yes. simplest I can. form? I can. The NFT. And I also want to know if your kids had any input. I needed it like some of kinder, kindergarten form. I'm going to go kindergarten because <laughs> kindergarten is what we all need right now. It's so early. Right. Let me give you some context. We're the same age, so this will definitely help. You guys are a little younger, but you should catch on to this. First, kindergarten stuff. If everybody understood how the world reacted to the internet in 96, 95, and 97, all of this stuff would make more sense. Everybody thought the internet was a fad. People shit on it. People never, people just didn't believe. Social, all three of you should definitely know that. When Twitter and Facebook first hit, people didn't realize it was gonna change the world. So first you have to accept that big technologies come along, so you gotta get curious. Back to earlier, you gotta get curious. The first thing I would tell everybody who's watching, forget about what I'm about to say. Actually, if you're watching this show, listening to this show, spend 10 hours Google, what did I do 18 months ago? What is an NFT? Enter in Google. What is an NFT? Enter in YouTube. And just 101, kindergarten shit, right? So first, everybody who's listening and watching, you owe it to yourself to not just dismiss it because your one friend said so, or because your one friend got it stolen, or they lost some money, or they made some money. You can't just make an opinion on that. You gotta do homework, that's number one. Number two, an NFT, the biggest reason that people are struggling with NFTs right now is they're using their internet knowledge to the blockchain. So all of us, everybody behind the scenes of this camera right now, we know what the internet is. We've been living it for 25 years. The blockchain's different, it's not the internet. It's a ledger that can prove ownership. Right. What does that mean? It means you can own digital shit. You couldn't own digital shit 
right. on the internet for everybody. You could own it inside of something. You could buy a sheep on Farm Bill back in the day and own it. You could own a Candy Crush thing, but you could only own it inside of Candy Crush or Farm Bill or Fortnite or Roblox or Minecraft. Mm-hmm. What the blockchain does is lets you own it to the whole world and everybody has to accept it. So you're owning something digital. Let's break this down for a minute. The four of us are all wearing Nikes. Only, what are we in 2020, only 50 years ago, which is like, mm-hmm. there weren't branded sneakers. People just wear f-ing sneakers. There were no pre-Converse, definitely pre-Nike. People just bought five, four, three, two, one dollar shoes and they just wore them. Today, all four of our sneakers cost extra than a base sneaker because it's a specific sneaker. Right. That's how fashion works. What, what I believe is gonna happen with NFTs is two things. A, an NFT stands for non-fungible token. That means nothing, just like HTTP or WWW means nothing on the internet. It means you own something digitally. Why is the big question. Why would you wanna own something digitally? It goes to two places. One, the place I was just going, because people want to flex and communicate. Right. All of us right now, if you look at the four of us, what we wear, what jewelry we have, what tattoos we have, what clothes we wear, everything we're doing right now, hair, hat, chain, sneakers, everything the four of us are doing right now was by subconscious choice to talk to the world. Yeah. This is who I am. Mm-hmm. That is a huge deal and it's a frothy thing to talk about with NFTs but it will be the reason NFTs are huge. The same reason people care about how many followers they have on social media, the same reason they care if they have a blue check mark, they don't own that, they don't hold it, is the same reason NFTs are gonna be big. People are gonna collect and own NFTs to communicate to the world who they are. Number two, NFT technology is gonna eat up a lot of functional parts of the world. For example, every sporting event, tickets to the game in 15 years will be an NFT, not a QR code. Why? Because technically it makes more sense. For the league, the NFL, for the teams, the Jags, the Jets, Steelers, and on, it's better for them to issue it as an NFT because if God willing, something magical happens that day, well then that becomes an asset, it gets sold, and they're gonna make a royalty commission on it. Mm -hmm. Right now it's a QR code. Go to eBay right now and type in, everybody who's listening, go to eBay right now. I know only five of you are gonna do this, but you're gonna learn. Type in used tickets, hit enter, hit completed auctions, and just watch how much money is spent every day on used tickets of right. a concert or a sporting event. So, for, cause like this is what happens. One, every single business call we have, Gary Vee, somebody on the call goes, I know Ryan doesn't care about this. <laughs> every single pivot business that call. That would be me. And it's mostly for it, right? And so, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the nervous guy with money. I'm the undrafted free agent. I yep. want to save money. I want to make smart Makes investments. Sense. So I'm a person that doesn't know about NFT, but I know about Twitter. Yep. And then I see some dude buys uh, what Jack Dorsey's first tweet. Huge as, mistake. As an NFT. Huge mistake. For what, how much was valued at a certain thing. Millions of dollars. Hundreds. And it sold for pennies. Because that was the same reason that Pets.com was worth billions. If you look back at early internet, all those internet companies were worth billions of dollars. They all went to zero. The same reason all of last year I made videos every day, 98% are going to zero, 98% are going to zero, 98% are, I like what you're doing, right? I recommend what you're doing. What I don't, I recommend what you're doing in the micro, I need you to do 20 hours of homework in the macro. Okay. Buying things frivolously, like a turtle with a cigar in its mouth for $20,000, that's smart. Don't do that. (laughs) But dismissing it, because of that is the mistake a lot of smart people are making. Understanding that this is the biggest technology infrastructure we've seen since the internet. For me, back to how young we are, you're gonna pay your taxes, you're gonna buy homes on the blockchain because it's better technology. Mm -hmm. Just like we order food now. Like when I said I'm gonna put my dad's liquor store on the internet, every person in 1996 said why would people buy wine on the internet? Or even better, I remember everyone's like, who's gonna buy wine on the internet? And my answer was everyone. And they thought that was crazy. They're like, why don't I just go to the store? I'm like, because it's better. Oh. It's better to buy on the internet. It's why dating happened that way. All my friends used to laugh at me when I told them everyone was gonna online date because when we were kids, that was like, you were a dork. You, that right. was weird shit. That was like, you live in your mom's basement. That ain't cool. <laughs> right. And I kept saying, yes, for now, but eventually, it's better. I'm like, 
I remember telling my friends in the dorm room, like, wouldn't it be awesome to just sit here, lay down, and just, and then you like meet up, like, you don't have to put in work. It's better, it's better technology. And that's why NFTs are gonna win. It's a better technology for a lot of things. These paintings, why do people buy an Andy Warhol? To communicate. They want their friends to come over and be like, yo, look at this $500,000 painting I have. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's a lot of work. And when you wanna sell it, a lot of work. NFTs, click, 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 click. So the whole collecting and art thing will go that way. Sports cards. When I, when I want to sell some Fred rookie cards on eBay, I got to list it, I got to post it, somebody's right. got to buy it, and then I got to ship it, and this and that. Now, click, 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 click. But then, more importantly, back to why the NFL will do this and other people do it, there's just so much value in the companies that issue the NFTs to issue them. And we, on the other side, from the paper tickets that we used to go and bring to sporting events, then it was an email confirmation, now it's a QR code in the app. We don't give a shit, we just need to get in the stadium. And that's why it's gonna play out. And I gotta say, half, half the fun of getting a woman is the, the chase. Yeah, but the chase it's becomes- running through the, 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 the Sahara yes, and getting the but gazelle. The, the question is, what's the Sahara? Bro. For some people, the Sahara is at the club and the bar. Yeah. For other people, it's the wordsmithing. The Sahara is the Sahara, depending on how you define it, right? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like, and that's real, right? Right, there, yeah, right. Yeah, and yeah, and, yeah. and as you can imagine, for especially we got a room full of guys. Listen, a lot of guys are scared of rejection, and that rejection in your face at the bar holds you back. But the rejection on online was tempered and didn't feel as bad. You didn't have to do it in front of your friends. And there's always pros and cons. Everybody tries to make like these things like this was good, this was bad. It's always the middle. For certain people it's better, for other people it's not. And that's okay. Here's the one thing I would say for all the listeners and for you three, technology doesn't give a fuck what we think. Right. Technology doesn't give a shit on our four opinions and everybody who's watching. Shit's gonna happen and it's our job to either grab the surfboard and ride that wave or let that wave crash us. And every time someone says no, they're just setting up for a wave to kill them. Wow. So you've given us so much knowledge already. You talked about the things that you've developed, companies you've invested in, the, the, the knowledge that you have just about simple investments. But the one thing I said riding over here, I was like, we all know he's a genius. We all know business-wise he, he gets it. He, he gives out information. He wants to see other people win. For us, winning is also family. Yeah. How do you have time to do family and kids Easy. and those different things Easy. and still be this entrepreneur, e a, a serial successful entrepreneur? O only because my content output confuses people. I've been so smart on how I produce content that, it, that I'm just so on every platform, high volume, it's like, Gary Vee's always on. I'm like, have you noticed though, I'm wearing the same t-shirt in this clip? This was a two hour talk that I've made 39 pieces of content. Most people make content. I live my life and produce content on the back end. Yeah. So there was this thing where I was meeting with this kid. It went super viral from years ago. The kid's like, how, how, how? And he finally like got me into this mindset. I was like, cause you have to document, not create. And it clicked for a lot of people. So for me, like I'm like, Weekends checked out, six, five, six, seven weeks of vacation. Like, listen, I work hard, but like the reality is it's not super hard because it's a priority of mine. I wanna be with my friends and family. Um, I just think I'm very effective and efficient when I'm on the field. Right. You know, a lot of people are like, sleep is a big one. I tell people all the time, like, I sleep seven hours a day. And they're like, nah, you, I'm like, yes. I'm like, it's just the other 17 hours are productive as Like, you know, it's about efficiency. And so, and it's also what we were talking about earlier. I think the thing that I, I try to take a step back and be introspective, I'm like, oh, okay. I love my shit so much. And again, actually, this will be fun to say for people listening. When I got into the sports, my brother AJ, we rep about 50 NFL players now, so we're really in it. And the thing that blew me away when we got into the game, we got in early, uh, excuse me, we were in the process early, we bought a small firm that had really one great player, Matt Paradis, the center in Carolina, now was in Denver. And you know, we start doing it, we're recruiting kids first couple years, and I'll never forget, I called AJ, and I was like, man, some of these guys don't love ball at all. And it was, I actually was excited about it. It was confusing to me, because I love my thing, of course, like many entrepreneurs, I wish I could have balled, right? But I was actually happy about it. I was like, oh, okay. 
they don't love it, they're just very thoughtful and they're like, this is how I'm gonna be financially sound, just like somebody going to college or something of that nature. But what I realize is like, so much of what I am is, I don't know who you think, and maybe you're that person, who the, out of all the years you played, starting at the beginning, whenever it was, who loved it the most? Yeah. Like, you know, I'm sure you guys have teammates that retired three years too late because they just were like, Fuck it. I'm not going until they drag right. my ass Some out. Some guys haven't even retired here. Like, they're still trying to I do know. it. I know, yeah. and so I've always, one of the biggest reasons I wanted to get into sports business and is because I want to teach a lot of athletes that entrepreneurship might be a taste of it. It's not gonna be the same. It's all, they're all different contexts. I've never experienced 60,000, 80,000 people cheering for you on the field, but I, I can tell you that what, confuses a lot of people with me and back to like never wanting to retire. My guys, I love this so much. I got D's and F's my whole life in school as a smart kid because I couldn't even give school one second. All I wanted to do in fourth grade to this second is start businesses, sell shit, be an entrepreneur, work. A lot like, of athletes are that way. That's right. You know, a lot of athletes that way. But you mentioned the field much like you mentioned the Sahara. The field, it, it, you know, when you when you sit back and look at it, you're in the field. You're just competitive, 100%. just in a different sense. A hundred percent, right? Just in a and and my whole life, Fred, I wanted to be you. And then somewhere around six years ago, I was like, damn, wait a minute, entrepreneurship's not not that it was better. I'm very grateful. A lot, you know, for you guys, unfortunately, like, you know. Time is undefeated in Correct. sports. Yeah. You could be the great, we've seen it, the greatest of all time eventually hit that place and even if it's late, it's, a, it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. With this thing, I can be 96 and you just kind of like, I, and I'm watching. One thing I do is watch. Like I said earlier when, when I wanted to give you guys some flowers because I'm really proud of you fellas because I really think you're doing it and on your way. I watch 70, 80, 90 year old entrepreneurs still doing it. And I see it, and like, of course, for some people, especially start getting to 80 to 90, your energy level, the brains at time, you know, and I, I watch it, but you can do this thing for quite a long time if you love it. And so I think what confuses people of like, does he have time, is this all he does? They're just mixing my passion. My passion for this is so high. There's not a lot of people I actually think on earth, I can only be tied with people for loving what they do. And you know what's crazy? Do you know what the closest comp I have for it? It was my mother being a mother. Mm. When my brother AJ, who's 11 years younger than me, left for college, my mom was depressed. And I was caught off guard. She was a young woman. You know, she had me when I was in the old country, 20. She was 31 when she had AJ, so she was 49, 48, you know, when AJ went to school. And she was, you know, that empty nest thing that they talk about, yeah. she was dead. And I remember at first I was concerned and worried and upset and trying to make her feel better. And then I took a step back, I'm like, man, this woman really lived her dream life. She wanted to be a mom. Mom was her ultimate. It was who she was built to be. And she's just dealing with like, damn, I'm not gonna be that, I'm gonna always be a mom, but this is different now. And it kind of remind me a little bit about sports. I'm like, damn. I, I wanna get into your little ones. You have two yeah. kids, right? Mm -hmm. How do they inspire you? I know they motivate you. But how do they inspire you? Do, did they have any inspiration or input into V Friends? They didn't have any input or inspiration to V Friends other than the subconscious nature of like them going through their childhood and all those shows were probably around. But I was very affected by by really the 80s cartoons like He Man and you know Voltron and Dang, Thundercats. Great and, yeah, yeah. Well, v Friends. I had Casco. V Friends Castle is his NFT, fellas. I mean, you guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna catch you up to speed. I learned that yesterday when I was Googling. <laughs> yeah, so V <laughs> Channing, V Friends is his NFT. And but two, break, could you break it out yeah, for Channing? Yeah, like, kiosk at the mall? Not yet. Okay. Oh, Not yet. Shit. <laughs> but, but, you know, there are the characters. It really is Sesame Street meets Pokemon. You know, Empathy Elephant, Patient Panda, these, these characters I'm gonna do kids' books and video games and kiosks in the mall. When I said not yet, I wasn't joking. Oh. I'm taking it from the digital to the physical. I want to build an amusement park like Sesame Place or Action Park or Great Adventure. As part of a utility? In the next Is 50 it? years, yes. And as they get older, you know, it's cool, right? Like, you get to see them become people and like, they're tenacious, both of them, which I really admire. I, I really admire tenacity. Man, because you talk about people and being an entrepreneur, you depend on people. You have 100%. to. 
You talked about it, and then you have this saying right here, don't worry about your bank account, worry about the people that show up to your funeral. Yeah. But there are good and bad people in this world. 100%. How do you decipher that? And when you figure out that this person is not helpful towards what Gary Vee's vision is, how do you cut them off? How do you get away from that? Now you're going to a place that I had to be vulnerable about recently. So I've, I tend to, I come from a family where like complaining is like the devil. Like our immigrant DNA, like we just don't complain. Like, and that's actually amazing and has been foundational for me. But as I've gotten older, I'm like, okay, there's some shortcomings in that. Because then you're really like not letting people fully in, you're not being vulnerable. People don't really know what is go like going on. And so candor is something I struggled with. So let me answer a couple quick things. First, I think of it the same way I think about everything. Good, bad, you know, light, darkness. You know, when you come, first I rely on my intuition. I've always had good spidey senses. Like I've met people along the way. First seconds of meeting them, like this doesn't feel good and I'm out. And so I've relied on that my whole life. Many people can get in, especially at the side, we got 2,000 employees. People get in without me vetting them now. Usually when I see negativity, people that hate on me in social or bad apples in my universe, usually my first reaction is compassion. And, and I know when people hear this, like this guy, I'm like, Okay, but like I'm telling you, my brain goes into what is f***ing this person up? Did they have a bad mama? Because I've lived a long time operating. I've had people who've gone from good to bad, you sit down with them instead of you're fired and go, yo, what's up? And they're like, I'm sorry, but my wife was just diagnosed with terminal cancer. All of a sudden you're like, of course you're not nice to Karen. You're barely holding on. <laughs> I love that you pick Karen. You know, so I like that. But you know what I mean? You're barely yeah. holding on in the office. And so I love compassion. I'm always quick to be like, you suck. Let me try to love you first before I hate you back. The biggest reason America's f***ed up right now is we hate on hate. We're just, like to me, I'm like, let me love you first. And by the way, six out of 10 times, it's a beautiful rap from there. They're so thankful somebody brought some love to them instead of hate and you go on to the Hall of Fame in that relationship. Four to 10 times, it's not gonna work out. It's too deep, you can't help them. You know, whatever it is. But for me, I think it's just about over communicating where I stand. If it doesn't work out, you have to fire. I was so bad at firing people my whole career that I would dance, dance around it. Every person that's ever worked for me at my dad's liquor store and at Vayner that doesn't love me is only because of the way I sloppily fired them. Mm. It's, a, it's a big regret of my career. There's definitely a dozen to two dozen people and it's tough, right? Because I actually have a low rate to fire. Like I like to develop people, you know, back to sports. Like I like developing that UDFA third year from practice squad. Like I love that dream. So I love seeing someone like, let me put in some time. Cause A, either it'll work out for us or B, I'll have some karma points cause they'll go into the world and do good things. So it takes a lot to get fired with me. Like you gotta kind of really stink. So you really gotta stink. And, and to me, I'm like, that was always my threshold. I'm like, you stink, what are you mad at me for? But I realized, I was doing a bad job because I wasn't communicating that they stunk. One of the reasons most people stink is they're not self-aware. Yeah. You guys know, right? All the people that complain like, coach is me up, coach isn't f you up. Right. You aren't in the playbook. You aren't put in the rep. But they love to blame and they're super not self-aware. So I was getting caught up, but now I call it kind candor. I tell people with as much compassion and empathy as I can, I'm like, look, this is not working out. So let's start building. Either are you ready to make a U-turn and can you build and listen to us? Or let me help you exit gracefully. So when you say sloppily fire people, what do you what do you mean by that? Early it... in my career, out of like on Tuesday, I'd be like, Stan, you're doing you're great. Stan, you're awesome. I love you, brother. I'm on Friday, I'd be like, Stan, you're fired. They'd be like, what the f Tuesday? <laughs> Tuesday you said we were brothers. So that was bad. Other times, if I was really close to them, because I get close. Yeah. I just couldn't even get there. I'd be like, Dad, can you fire Rick? And then Rick's like, I mean, never even talked to your dad. The you, that was bad. Yeah. Here, over the 13 years, similar to the Stan one, I do a review meeting with somebody, they got nothing but shit that they suck at. I spend the entire 15 minutes telling them what they're awesome at. Four months later they get fired, they're like, you know, like I was never able to be candorous because I didn't like hurting people's feelings. I over, I over went there, which created entitlement. 
which created people not knowing where they stood with me. The reason I changed was the number one thing I think a leader's job is, is to eliminate fear. It's my number one belief. If you're a leader, parent, business owner, president, like number one rule, eliminate fear. A lot of people weaponize fear in the reverse, but I think it's elimination. When I realized people here were scared, because after a decade of doing it, people were like, yo, Gary will like pat you on the back, but in six months you could be fired because he's not gonna tell you it's not going well. I'm like, I'm trying to be nice in the micro, but I'm fucking it up in the macro. Yeah. People are scared. Not, not junior people, not because it, it was the senior people. Because that was the ones I was most interacting with. I was like, I gotta change this. It was a really humbling moment for me. I was really sad. I don't know what else to tell you. I was like, damn. Because I, back to earlier part of this interview, like I'm trying to go for it. And I think the Hall of Fame of what I do is not just the money. Bezos and Musk, some of these people are gonna make more money than I'm gonna make. I wanna be the greatest entrepreneur because I did enough to put me on the board financially because I, don't, I know I can't get it any other way. Like nobody will give me that roses if I don't. But I wanna be one of the great enablers of other entrepreneurs. And one quick, because you brought up fear. A man like you, what are your fears? What are your insecurities? Because your confidence is through the damn roof. My confidence is through the damn roof in life. I am petrified of my own health. Like, I don't want to wake up and be like, oh, my side hurts, and go to the doctor, and the doctor's like, you're gonna die. Wow. I'm incredibly fearful of that. Like, 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 I don't even like saying it right. Like, like, me and the 12 people I love the most, I just want them to live forever. I'm not, I'm, I'm way better than I was 10 years ago. I think it comes with age. But fuck man, if we're, if we're being transparent here, I'm petrified of health. Because everything else, I'm in control. Mm. When you're born with little and you're happy, you're an unstoppable force. Yeah. When I was five, six, right? Yep. When I was five, six, seven, eight, nine, and like, it. yeah, exactly. Like, I got real goosebumps right now on this one. <laughs> I don't need money to be happy. I'm happy. So like when you have that, you're not scared. And I know that I can flip the script on any perspective. I'm always gonna be happy. I don't need shit. I'll live in a studio apartment in Queens again and be happy as f- to rise up again. Like I'll be on some rocky shit, you know? But the health thing scares me. When you are in the shoes of Woody Johnson yes. when that day comes. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. if Zach Wilson throws an interception to said <laughs> yeah. DB. How do you? I'm very concerned. We're we're talking about how you respond to your employees here. I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned. (laughs) I want to be transparent so we can play these clips in 30 years when I'm doing it. I am. One of the things that I'm excited about being the Jets owner is there's no fan of the Jets at that time that's gonna be. I'm gonna be like, "Fuck you!" I'm a bigger fan than you. So like that relationship with the fans is gonna be amazing because I'm a real fan and I can really reminisce and know the history and I've watched every play of a Jets game since 1982, so I'm in it. Is it kind of Mark Cuban-ish? I think Mark's done a really good job, actually. If you look at Dirk, if you look at what I perceive, I could be wrong, well, time will play out, Luca. Yeah. like I think, I think he plays a good version of it. Yeah. Um, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, so you know, for all the people that work in that organization, they know. I know a couple things. One, I'm in control of who the GM is. Yeah. So the way I run this organization is definitely gonna be a preview to the Jets. I get to decide who the GM is, who she or he is. Right. I wanna do that one day. Got so you, right? Yeah. So I, I feel great about I hired him or her, but I'm not gonna do their job. Like I don't know which owners, you know, you hear about Jerry, you think about like in basketball, like the joke with LeBron being the GM. Like yeah. I, for me, whoever the GM is, she or he is gonna be the fucking GM. I may ask for the seventh round pick just because you know they get the UDFA. I'd like to maybe play, but like as far, I would never, ever, ever, I only believe in good, good culture. I would never, even though I'd want to. And if people could record me being mad in the owner's box, but I would never struggle with, you know, a five interception game or things right. of that nature. I've got, I, I think I know how to build a winning organization, but I'm a fan first. Right. You know, the Jets were one of the first clients of VaynerMedia. And the first thing I told them was, do not hire us because I'm fan first. And it played out. Sanchez threw five picks against Buffalo in his rookie year. 
and I, and I love Mark. Him and I have come close. I tweet out, fuck you, Sanchez. And the president of Jets is like, <laughs> yo. And I was like, and I was crazy. They called me on some like, they're the client, they have say shit. And he's like, hey. And I was like, you hey. I fucking told you I'm fan first. <laughs> I love that. So. Speaking of fan first, yes. I just need one favor. Uh, you said you were a fan of the show. Yes. And, and we love that. A few years ago, you predicted that Joe Rogan would get 100 mil. Whenever you're doing something and you just out in these streets need and somebody asks you and somebody asks you about the pivot, can you throw the 100 mil out for Listen, us? Can I, can I throw something for the pivot for you guys? A couple things. One, this show, um, there's a lot of people back home, like you guys have to pump out as much TikTok content as humanly possible. Hmm. So this episode, take three or four or five clips, pump out TikTok. Right now, there's a 12 to 18 month window that I've seen before, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, MySpace back in the day, the reason Dane Cook and Tila Tequila were famous, it's all the same game. When there's a platform that's giving you more reach than you already have by just posting, you fucking post. Right. You know, back to football, there was a Jets Raiders game in 1994 where the Raiders ran the ball 27 times in a row. And to this day, I still don't understand I mean, I do understand, because I know the sport pretty well, but I still believe in what the Raiders did against the Jets that game. So, and you guys definitely know this. Sometimes the matchup is just the matchup, mm. and the play will work every time. Yep. And there's a part of you as an offensive coordinator and as an organization, you got, you're thinking about a lot of things, like contract, I mean, there's a million things running through an organiz- a head coach, and a, but like sometimes you just run the ball 27 Plays wow. in a row, I love even it. in the NFL. I mean, you would have loved it. Love it. <laughs> Not just the running, but the, the, the concept. The, yeah, the, the concept, concept, right? Because it probably right. lands for you guys. Because right. we don't see that. Even when it's obvious, they got to mix it up because you know the receivers might be mad. like. I understand the 360 version of it. You run it every play. The receivers going to come and be like, you know, and receivers, you know how they are. And so that's what TikTok is right now. I keep putting out this content for the last three years. Make TikTok, make TikTok, make TikTok. People hear me, but they don't hear me. So I think your show can take another quantum leap if every episode you're making four, five, seven, 12 pieces of TikTok per episode and putting it out there. You guys are on your way. You have a real show here. A thi- like I'm good at what I do. I've been early on a lot of things. Very quickly I'm like this has a shot and then I see you guys moving. It's about post-production for social media that will take you to the next step. Man, well, thank you. Listen, oh, listen, we we get Gary V advice for free. I'm all in, man. Thank I was you so much. Notes, man. Yeah. I, 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 I look <laughs> at my phone. I was writing stuff down. Hey, th- thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you, fellas. Uh, the 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 platform we try to provide is to help people, but also it helps us learn. Man. I see. We it. learned a ton I see from it. you today, man. It's a real thank pleasure. you so much, bro. All right, fellas. Bye, guys. Yes, sir. Oh, love oh, man. Man. Thank you, man. So much fun. Yep. Appreciate you, fam. Such a pleasure. Yes, sir. My bad. My bad too, bro. Dude, <laughs> I loved watching you play. You had it, man. Hold up. Limitless, they can see me kind of pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless, they can see me kind of pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the